Zhuangzi would counter, on the other hand, that um, the reason that we save the child is actually from our innate fear of death, uh, and that it's actually not out of being inherently good. So the Taoist perspective would be to kind of let go of um, life and death, and the um, you know let go of life as being superior to death which is very challenging in a medical practice where people are usually paying you to keep them alive. Hello, that's right. You've tuned in once again to Watar. Why are we talking about rabbits? That's a pod where we talk about heavy things lightly. Pod addresses modern man's dislocation by addressing modern man's new world understanding of himself. And we try to learn and laugh along the way. Today, we've invited James Dr. Mohabali, he is a doctor of Chinese medicine and a specialist in acupuncture, and he's going to join us as we all wonder aloud, why are we talking about rabbits? This is episode nine. This is old world medicine and inconvenient truths. Today we have... In studio, uh, a friend, a doctor, my doctor, a guy named James Mahobali, and I think we can call you a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine, am I right? That is correct. Um, welcome, first of all, and I, I got to tell people how I met you. Can I, I do that? Please do. <laughs> first of all, this dude is, he's badass, and but I didn't know that because my wife sent me up to meet you after my back was killing me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was through a friend of mine, Herman, a friend of ours. But I didn't know you very well. I had met you, but I didn't know it was you. Mm -hmm. I wasn't paying attention. It's my life, James. That's what you're helping me with, by the way. So she said, I got a guy. But she didn't know you either, really. She no. said, go up here. And she made an appointment. because I, And I thought you were a chiropractor. <laughs> the whole drive up. Like an hour. Doo, 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 doo. This isn't going to work. And then he says, I'm going to stick needles in you now. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, wait a minute. So I met you and I'm like, oh, I remember you kind of. Oh, so, and then I, I said, what What are we doing exactly? He said, well, we're going to do an assessment, yada, yada. And then the next thing you tell me is about acupuncture. I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. You are not Chinese, but you practice Chinese medicine. That is correct. I'm actually Iranian. Go figure. <laughs> Mohobali. Yes. James. So tell me your first name. My first name uh, given to me at birth is actually Jamshid, first king of Persia. Um, so, but growing up in America, I was always Jamie. So James was a natural transition. Got it. Got it. And then Chinese medicine. We'll get into that. Okay. But before we do, because you're a guest on our pod. And by the way, we're going to have guests from time to time. We got some cool stuff lined up. Um, uh, we're going to do the lidometer test with you. Mm. You've been listening, right? I have been listening. I already took the lidometer alone, but I am interested to see whether under duress okay, I have a good. different response. So we'll get more into who this guy is in a second, but we're going to put him through the lidometer exam. Here we go. We're trying to figure out old world, new world attitudes, philosophies, how they reside within us, what even that means. So we came up with this test. You ready? I'm excited. Here is the lidometer test as per why are we talking about rabbits? Answer these on a zero to three scale. Zero means no, I don't think so. Three means, yeah, that totally makes sense to me. Two means sort of makes sense. And one means not feeling it, but it could be right in my world of the James world. Here we go. Here's your first question. When I die, and you're just reacting to this question, when I die... I won't really die all the way. It's more like I'll sleep and I'll be waiting for some type of next world. Three all the way. Three. Something's coming. Yes, absolutely. Will you do the math? Because I'll probably forget. We can write it down right there. You can write it right in my book. All right. He's written a three, ladies and gentlemen. Here's your, sex, second, here's your sexy second question. The best way to get to know me is to ask someone else about me that one i had a lot of trouble with by myself i'm gonna say what i said last time which is two two did not change your answer from your 
solo examination. No. And the reason why is because I feel that I don't know anyone other than my wife who would be a good uh, good person to oh, you're ask. Not, so you're not <laughs> you're not trusting of the human race no. to have insight on your on your spiritual self. I like it. All right, that's good too. It's a two. Here's your third question. Remember, this is science. Let's let's stay focused on the. This is objective. I think this could be given to anyone at any time in history. <laughs> and like thirty billion people could have taken this, and we could have solved the problems of the world. Here's your third question. When I carry a picture around of, say, a friend or a parent or even a puppy, and it's like near me or on my wall, that picture, when it's in my presence, actually brings the person closer to me in some sort of reality, like they're actually present. I would say that my answer uh, is two, but if I was a more authentically Chinese, I would give an answer of three. But you're sticking with two. I'm sticking with two. Yeah, we don't. We, Chinese medicine, we're getting to that, but that's a two for you. Because mm -hmm. we got to find out where you grew up. That's going to matter, I think. <laughs> All right, here's your fourth question. Respect, James, isn't earned. It is owed by you to others. Respect, not earned, owed by you to others. Uh. I'm going to go with a two again. Two. So you're leaning toward that's probably true. Definitely probably true. Um, it is. It's hard to say that everybody deserves respect. Um, it just kind of goes against my nature. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I love it. Stretching you. Okay. What's your number two? Number two. You got it down on yeah. question four. And number, this is the fifth question. I've rewritten this one a little bit. So should you grow old? You're not that old right now. How old are you? I am 29 right now. 29. Should you grow old and should you have kids? By the way, this applies to everybody. Mm -hmm. You hope to go and live with those kids, right? When you get old so they can take care of you and clean you and feed you and all that stuff before you die. I see that you've reworked this question, which I, did. I appreciate. I worked it. Um, to this question, um, I answer. I answer a three. All the way in. All the way in. Thumbs I, up. I want to raise my kids so that they will take care of me, so that I will be in my grandkids' lives all the time in their house. <laughs> You're just hanging around. Oh, I'm just I'm just sitting around. Barking out orders <laughs> at like 85. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> all right, three. Let's add you up. Let's figure it out, and then we'll get to talking about who you are and why you're on the show. I'm so happy to have you. Um, what's your number? My number... I can do the math properly, is a 12. 12. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a 12 in the studio today. Here's what a 12 is on the Lidometer scale. A 12 is called a villager. You did get into the villager category. According to science, remember, this has been studied and vetted. Uh, I think this was recently uh, uh, in the Journal of um, New England Medicine. Yeah. Yeah, I made it in. Uh, this is means the old world, James, is in your bones. There's really a good chance you hate malls. Places like Algeria and Ethiopia will roll out the red carpet for you. Uh, your Spotify collection includes chants, some sort of uh, old world music that you can't pronounce the province from which it comes. And you love that you don't understand the language of the chants and you wish there was more hierarchy in the world. Sounds accurate. Does it sound accurate? <laughs> yes, you nailed it's it. It's science. It's <laughs> it's objective. It's measurable, and it's real. <laughs> All right, you are a villager. All right, guys. Here's the deal. James comes to you because today I wanted to talk about the old world concept of conservation and environmentalism, because what happened was, is I read this thing. So what is this thing? It's a paragraph that comes, I'm putting my glasses on. It comes from a guy named Philip Sherrard, and it comes from a book called Human Image, World Image. I want you all to hear this. 
everything that exists participates in the creative energies of the highest life of all. So remember, on this show, we're trying to figure out, hey, wait a minute, what is old world co a concept? This is super old world in that many cultures before the Enlightenment thought like this, I think. And that's what we're going to talk to James about. So everything that exists participates in, in the creative energies of the highest life of all. Everything, he writes, created has its point of contact with the spiritual world. And it possesses its own individual consciousness. Whoa. So like um, a rock or a, a seagull has a individual consciousness, consciousness. When things live and act in accordance with their natural intrinsic nature, they live and act within a relationship of mutual harmony, all rooted in the being of the creator. Whoa. When things live and act according to their natural intrinsic nature, they live in accordance with the creator. Okay, can you guys feel out? I notice there's no Muhammad in there. There's no Viking God, Thor. There's no Jesus. There is, though, this profound relationship between the big and the small. They're actually participating. Now he goes on. Here's the last part. It is due to a breach in the relationship between man, humans, and the creator God, God. And that breach, that break, right? is what caused nature to go off the rails. Let me say that again. I'll actually read the quote. There is a breach in the relationship between human beings and God, and that breach has fall, has, and whereby man has fallen from the order of life to which by nature he belongs. In other words, man got knocked in the head from this breach, and now the whole created world sighs and throbs with pain. That's the environmentalism part. So let me just say this. I think Sherard James is saying something like volcanoes go crazy and bats bite humans and COVID flies around because human beings screw up. And according to Chinese thought, this is absolutely the case. Um, in particular, the emperor was, um, sorry, Trump, uh, <laughs> in particular, the emperor was, uh, if he was out of harmony with nature, um, then all sorts of things would happen, ranging from eclipses to rebellions to crop failure and famine. Um, and this is most the case with the emperor, but then it kind of trickles down. And if you are um, in a Confucian household, uh, then if you disrespect your father, for example, and you go against his orders, then that could bring disease and misfortune into the household. Oh, so that's a a mini version of the major, right? His uh, so all of the earth upset by man's actions. Son upset upsets the relationship between father and then illness creeps in. Absolutely. I wonder how many people out there think that's. <laughs> True. I think the Confucian part of Chinese medicine is a little bit more challenging for people than the Taoist part, which is very much akin to, um, you know, kind of a everything flows, uh, environmentalism, very much in contact with nature. The interesting thing is that they actually um, circle back around and they um, they meet one another. Taoism. And Confucianism. Okay. And the Both relation... being Chinese, cult culturally Chinese. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And the um, the Taoist, it's more than a philosophy. That's an important thing to point out. So it's actually the main religious system of China from roughly 200 onwards um, was Taoism, was religious Taoism, which mm -hmm. had liturgies, rites, um, you know, specialized practices, um, exorcisms, you know, anything you can think of that a religion should have. Interesting. So... Sherard in his book is particularly writing about Eastern Christianity, but he's also trying to present a world before the Enlightenment. And then the Enlightenment comes along. Now, let's just introduce you for one more second. Mm -hmm. You're actually practicing in North Carolina, right? Yes, I am a practicing acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist in uh, Rutherfordton, North Carolina. So you have an office, because I've been to it, because yes. I thought you were my chiropractor. <laughs> Uh, by the way, people, it's not the same at all. <laughs> There's needles. It's crazy. 
Highly recommend it. Uh, so when people like me, well, I'm a weirdo because I'm not from here, but when people walk into your office, do they know what they're getting into? I didn't know at all. But when they hear acupuncture, like these are guys from the hills. I mean, you're in a really rural part of North Carolina. When you talk like you just spoke, when you speak like that, mm -hmm. how do North Carolinian Americans hear you? I think that uh, North Carolinian Americans, especially in the foothills, actually hear me a lot better than um you know, I, I also uh, went to school in Boston and worked in the student clinic there. And um, they the Bostonians have the hardest time uh, processing Chinese medicine uh, because it doesn't fit into their highly scientific worldview and their highly cutting-edge Western medical establishment. Um, here in North Carolina, um, you know, I don't necessarily go into the specifics of Taoism versus Confucianism, but people tend to respond well. Uh, in general, we don't talk that much about the philosophical underpinnings. Got it, got it. But um, one great thing about Chinese medicine is that the philosophy is very much alive. So sometimes you do bring in a little bit here and a little bit there in order to cement the treatment and in order to make people um, understand what they were missing in their lives and what they could use more of. So here's it's, I really want to, I want to keep going back to this, but I, then I want to go into your life too. Cause I also want to hear how you grew up because it's interesting, mm -hmm. but back to the philosophy for a minute in some ways. And we could go on with Sherard's book if we wanted to, but he's going to go on to imply things like this. If you want to fix global warming or climate change, fix human souls, when you started working on my back, you started with my liver. Mm -hmm. So that's what made me want to bring you in here today. <laughs> I just want you to know, because I was reading that, preparing, and I went, wait a minute, why am I trying to do this? I'm going to bring James in here. When you're working on my liver to fix my back, what the hell is going on there? Well, um, working on your liver to fix your back. So the liver, um, there's a system of correspondences, systematic correspondences in Chinese medicine um, where the liver corresponds to the springtime, corresponds to um, the color green, corresponds to the emotion of anger. Um, you know, every organ in the body has a correspondence to outside um, phenomena, whether that's a climate and emotion. And when uh, the tissue that the liver corresponds to is the sinews. So when the sinews are tight, when the sinews are non-functional, um, often that implies that there's a liver problem where their, their liver is not nourishing the sinews for some reason. So by using points along the liver channel that are unrelated to his back, um, we can actually treat his back and loosen up his back just by using those, um, those liver points. Same with the toes. That's when you heat up my toes. It's the same concept. <laughs> um, the toes are a little bit more literal, um, where heating up the toe, it's kind of like, uh, there's a point at the end of the toe that where all of the sinews kind of bind together, it's called a Jing well point. And at the Jing well point, um, you can use that leverage, um, on the rest of the body to kind of grab the muscles and loosen them up. Um, so the, Use, heating up the toes, it doesn't have as much of an organ affinity. It's more of just a tissue affinity. I see. And then to go back to the, the metaphor, which I don't think in Sherard's book and in Eastern Christianity, it's not a metaphor. It's actually a reality. There was a saint, Serov, mm -hmm. uh, of Serov, Seraphim, whose answer to pretty much everybody who came and say, Rush is falling apart. And he would say, oh, okay, four hours of prayer for you. <laughs> if you're like, wait a minute, but there's like, you know, there's an anarchist movement afoot. And he'd be like, I know five for you. <laughs> They'd be like, what are you talking about? And he had this, this notion of radiation, of the spirit radiating out point by point. Mm -hmm. And the radiation would literally change. I don't want to say molecular level energies, but I think you could argue that on some level, the beauty of your soul can in a molecular kind of way be transmitted to others. And we talk about energies, right? Mm -hmm. And he didn't talk energies in that, the, that vocabulary, but he did say, save yourself. And then the entire environment, volcanoes, 
right? And rivers overflowing and co- would be would be actually healed. And that's the same with the body in some ways. Absolutely. Um, so one way of breaking into Chinese science is by looking at crystals. Crystals are really, um, they're considered to be a very basic life form, but a complete life form. So every life form in Chinese has its completion, where you can have a rock, which is not so great. It's still working on itself. And then the completion of that, when it kind of becomes godlike, is Ah. a crystal. Um, So what we look for in the body are structures that are crystalline in nature. So... Um, collagen, which is the tissue that the um, the channels run through from a biomedical perspective, the collagen has crystalline properties like piezoelectricity. Um, another natural crystal in the body is the bones. Another natural crystalline structure is actually the brain. So using these different crystal structures, we can kind of begin to understand how these emanations might happen from a very physical basis. You know, if you um, if you take a tuning fork that has the same frequency as a quartz crystal and you ring that tuning fork next to the quartz crystal, the quartz crystal will start vibrating. Mm-hmm. And that's because the quartz crystal is perfectly organized and perfectly symmetrical so that it responds to this particular frequency. Um, so those, obviously our bones aren't all one consistency, but it's specific parts of the bones might resonate with specific frequencies and uh, you know specific parts of the brain might resonate with specific frequencies and then is is so is the crystallization of the rock or the the meeting of the proper frequency is that type of is that a type of a deification a fullness a, a type of coming into full order absolutely uh, one of the main metaphors in chinese both confucian and taoist thought is um, polishing jade as a way, means of human perfection. So you start off as a rough kind of knobby, you know, piece of jade with inclusions and you polish it until it's perfect, shiny and, um, you know, beautiful and crystalline. Do you think that's a, so now apply that to say you mm-hmm. or your future child or my children. Are we doing that? I think to um, ourselves. I think that, No matter what, the rock gets tumbled and the jade gets polished. It's a matter of how much you're being cognizant of that process. And this this is very much how medicine works, where, you know, we run our body in the same exact way over and over again, day in, day, day in, day out. And that creates certain ruts in the jade that creates a certain way that the body is. And we can always take more awareness of that and choose where we put these ruts we can choose how to perfect the jade or we can just kind of leave it to the whips and scorns of time but either way there's some sort of continuum absolutely okay now can you you might not be able to but i know you so i think you can can you Talk about the differences with Western medicine, New World. In this show, it would be called the New World Lig. I mean, there's a revolution, right, in the 15th and 16th centuries, really 17th too. Actually, 17th and 18th. But this 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 revolution, it, I wouldn't say it, fund, well, it fundamentally changes maybe the way we're talking right now. Can, do you see evidence of this in terms of Western medicine? Or um. Yes, Western medicine is a medicine that is fundamentally based on Harvey, um, who discovered the circulation of blood and overturned the um, Galenic philosophy of medicine, which had been in place since late antiquity Mm -hmm. in Greece. Um, So when Harvey came along... What what years are we talking about? Oh, um, You don't have to be perfect. Late antiquity is probably around, again, 200 or so. How about for Harvey? For Harvey, we're talking about, I think, 1500, 1600. Oh, okay. Yeah. Enlightenment. Okay. Yeah. Harvey is, Descartes, um, in his Discourse on Method, um, exalted Harvey as like the perfect example of like the conquest of scientific knowledge, where by experimentation, um, you know, Harvey did a lot of vivisection. Um, Harvey did a lot of experiments using arteries and veins. And he ultimately put together that um, rather than a circulation of blood that goes um, begins in the liver and goes to the heart and um, follows the Galenic pattern, it actually goes out to the extremities and back in to the heart. 
um, in a circle, which changes the way that we think about physiology. So Western medicine is fundamentally based on the success of Harvey, um, where the the heart muscle and the whole cardiac and cardiovascular system uh, works more or less like plumbing. Unfortunately, most things in the body don't work like plumbing, where, you know, if you block off, you know, from here, then it'll uh, cut off the flow to another part of the body. Um, so the heart and the cardiovascular system from um, the Harvey perspective is wonderfully linear. And as a result, Western medicine tends to be extraordinarily linearly, uh, extraordinarily linear and very mechanical, um, kind of like working on a car. And, and now here's the one, I want to use this word on purpose. I, I don't know what you'll do with it and therefore untrue or cause we're talking about ligs, which I'm going to ask you what your lig is here. Just to remind our crew lig here comes from the root of religion and that which binds your worldview together. So we'll ask James in a second what his lig is, but is that lig that way of seeing the body and as plumbing do you like the word use the word true or untrue or is that uncomfortable i think it's i think it's a very uncomfortable thing in the context of medicine because medicine is highly pragmatic so it doesn't to some extent um it doesn't really matter what's true as long as it works for someone um so when we have people successfully having artificial hearts put in and you know amazing surgeries happening from Western medicine, viewing the body as ultimately a, you know, system of plumbing, um, that's extraordinary. And that saves people's lives and that helps people a lot. Um, and it gives them more time to experience life. Um, however, one of the things that you see a lot with heart disease in particular is that the heart is a very spiritual organ. It's, um, in Chinese medicine, it's where the heart has an affinity with the spirit. It has an affinity with the soul. And the soul is, um, it's conveyed in the blood in Chinese medicine. It's not in the blood, but it kind of resides there. Um, so when you have heart problems, there's usually some kind of deep spiritual or emotional component that no matter if you do transplant the heart, uh, it remains unresolved. Um, so that can be, um, in that sense, it could be considered to be untrue in that it's not actually fixing the problem. But again, what works, works in medicine. Right. And works here is practical because I like what you said. Med medical practices, they're really about just getting things done and, and making people live with some modicum of happiness. Mm -hmm. So you're not against Western medicine in that sense? No, I am absolutely not against Western medicine. Um, it just has some philosophical challenges that... Um, have not been examined because it has such a hold on society right now and because the Enlightenment is so, you know. Powerful. Powerful, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so what's your leg? So, again, leg is worldview. What holds your worldview together? I'm feeling Taoism or Chinese something something or you're in, you're a Iranian born. Well, you weren't born in Iran. No, I was born in suburban Maryland outside of D.C. to um, two Iranian immigrant parents who came over before the revolution um, when Iran was experiencing like a secular revitalization. They were throwing uh -huh. out religion. They were having a blast. Yeah. Avant-garde uh, art and, um, you know. So secular Iranian parents. And here you are now. What What's your leg? My leg... Um, if you had to put uh, two words to it, it would be, I'm an Orthodox Christian. Um, but the interesting thing is that I was actually led into Orthodox Christianity through my study of first Chinese medicine and then Taoism. Um, and then I stumbled into Orthodox Christianity. And it's... It's okay. They're, they're, they don't cancel each other out. You're not doing voodoo or something. <laughs> <laughs> I am not doing. You don't get voodoo. in trouble with like these bearded. By the way, James has a marvelous beard. If you saw this thing, it's killer. <laughs> <laughs> Long black beard. I'm going. I, you know, do people call you? Um, 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 geez, now it just slipped my mind. I'm old. The Russian monk. 
Re- not Raskolnikov. That's Dostoevsky. Rasputin. <laughs> Rasputin. That never happened to you? <laughs> not yet. Maybe in the future. Okay, I won't do it. I won't do it. I just did it, though. So we're not calling you that, Rasputin. But here's the situation. It doesn't conflict. You don't find people coming at you trying to figure out this voodoo that you're talking about, or is it consistent in some weird way? Um, I find that it's extremely consistent. Um, the most problems that I've encountered deals with people that have come to Orthodox Christianity through a heavily um, Protestant background, actually. And they are um, they worked really hard to find their way into Orthodox Christianity and away from their Protestant baggage. And um, they are very guarded about what they're willing to let into their um, worldview. And when I say it's Chinese medicine, some people immediately get turned off. And that happens in the secular world, too, where people just think, you know, nothing good comes out of China. Um, so I believe that there is no better medicine for Orthodox Christians than Chinese medicine. Um, it's after all, it is how I came to Orthodoxy. Are you married? I am married uh, to my wonderful wife, Monica. Does she get you in all of this? Does she see the world in a similar way? Well, when I say that I led us into Orthodox Christianity, I'm not being entirely truthful. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> I, my wife, um, I was uh, deep in the study of medicine, and my wife began the study of religious Taoism. And through her study of religious Taoism, liturgical practices, um, and that sort of thing, she ended up finding Orthodox Christianity, and we went to church together, and the rest is history. Got it. Got it. So one of the things that's happened with my family after I came back from the chiropractor slash acupuncturist, I was like, guys, this is crazy. But it was really helpful. And by the way, it was actually freed it freed my pain on one level and i'm continuing to go back but that's whatever it's not important in terms of this this interview but this is important when i've come home i've started to see my body a little differently including my body's character can you describe i'm a wood right Mm -hmm. um can you describe this early phase of of receiving a patient when you try to sort of look at them and try to figure out how their body works. Would you would you describe that process? Because it was super fascinating hearing about my body type and my spirit type and how that works. Can you explain that? So um, to begin with, there are five elements, not four elements, in Chinese medicine. Um, and that corresponds to the five seasons, not four seasons, which is difficult for some people. Um, the seasons are uh, spring, summer, late summer, fall, and uh, winter. And in order that's um, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. So again, that's wood, spring, summer, fire, late summer, earth, um, corresponding to humidity and dampness, which is very much present in South Carolina in August. Mm -hmm. Um, And fall being dryness and metal, and uh, then winter being um, water and coldness. Uh, So these are the five elements, and we classify people according to... Everybody has all five elements in some measure, but some people, everybody has one that is more predominant in their lives. Um, So in John's case, he's a little bit more wood, which means that his voice is a little bit more saxophony sounding. Um, The traditional Chinese description is actually uh, yelling. It sounds like he's yelling. (laughs) I think that's true. (laughs) That's really true. Um, I, Terrifying. I like to talk about it. It's a whisper yell where it sounds like he's just uh, yelling while whispering. And my voice, as <laughs> as we all know, is uh, groaning. Um, so it sounds kind of not quite like a creaky door, which is more of a metal thing, but kind of like somebody who's just tired and you just woke them up. I think there's actually evidence that that was the same as Rasputin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Although Rasputin was a black magician. Oh, was he? Okay, <laughs> he was. sorry. <laughs> well, uh, check the pod notes. We'll we'll do, we'll put some research in there on Rasputin's <laughs> voice. Um, so basically, when people come in, um, 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. What I am trying to do is, of course, listen to what they're saying and figure out what they want me to do for them. But from a practitioner standpoint, what I'm working on figuring out is why this thing is out of balance for them. Because you can have back pain that's due to kidney problems. You can have back pain that's due to liver problems. You can have back pain that's due to spleen problems. And they're all a little bit different. Um, so the first thing that's very important to consider is who somebody is and what their type is. Um, and by understanding who they are, you understand what problems they might face in life. Um, so while I'm uh, listening to people, I'm also looking at their, um, their facial structure, their body structure, um, listening to their voice, um, looking at their, the shape of their fingers and their toes, and um, trying to figure out what element predominates in them. Interesting. So now here you are. This is the million dollar question because it's sort of worth million dollars of, of relevance to all of us. Here you are a guy steeped in Chinese culture and Chinese medicine. Um, you kind of see the world through that worldview. You, you know, of course, with the Orthodox Christian uh, East as a foundation. And, and then you walk in here and you're talking to me and, you know, the old world is our work and we're out there and we're trying to get back to Sierra Leone right now and back to Guatemala and send our guys back in the field. And we're all steeped in trying to figure out COVID. And here you are. <laughs> a doctor. You're a doctor. Mm -hmm. It's funny, when I first came back, you know, I was like, well, that was really cool for my back. And then I, I was like, I got dizzy or something. And I was thinking, oh, I got to get my heart checked. And my wife went, we'll go back to James. I was like, oh, he's not really a heart doctor. And she went, no, he's an all things doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's how it works. One body. So you get the way in today. What, what is COVID? What's happening? How do you see it from your perspective? Um, COVID is a very fraught topic for sure. Um, and I think that most medical professionals don't want to talk about COVID. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds scary. Um, especially those that have unusual viewpoints. Um, so you don't, you don't have to right now. Well, I will say that, um, Chinese medicine, China much more so than Europe, it seems, had to deal with constant, frequent epidemics. So they have a very detailed um, medicine surrounding epidemics and um, what causes them, how to manage them. Um, and this came to actually a culmination in uh, like 1644. Um, this was the beginning of the new school of Chinese medicine called the Wenbing School, which deals specifically with epidemic disease. Now, the 1600s in China were a very difficult time. There was a lot of crop failure, a lot of famine. The empires were changing over. The current emperor, the Ming emperor, who was the last um, like ethnic Chinese emperor, um, he was losing the mandate of heaven, they said. And for the first time in thousands, well, aside from the Mongols, for the first time in um, thousands of years, China had gone to a different ethnic group than the main ethnic group in China. This was viewed as a massive loss to China. At the same time, we had um, Western influence, we had outside influence. And so this viewpoint that began to emerge in the Wenbing current was one where epidemics were caused by outsiders. Epidemics were caused by um profound immorality in society you know with outsiders comes opium with outsiders comes um you know port cities and everything that happens in a port city um so it became that epidemics in the most recent chinese medical understanding were characterized by um kind of losing the mandate of heaven um which i think sherard might agree with yes um so that's where the Chinese medical understanding about epidemics comes from. So one simple way of phrasing it would be that um, COVID is happening because it is the thing that needs to happen to sort of purify the impurities that have begun to emerge in our society. And uh, our society here being on this show, we talk about LIG, it, 
is that the new world league the enlightenment league has needs a type of purification am i saying that right or would you shy away from that um so when i say purification first uh, i think that word can be fraught i would rather focus on the analogy of metallurgy where the impurities there don't um you just want to remove them to get the final metal product. Um, so I think that where we're at as a society, we have um, we have a worldview that has a lot of extraneous matter in it. Um, you can see this uh, with like restaurants. You know, all restaurants now have gone to a very limited menu where they've taken their core items, stripped away all the extra stuff, and they're just serving like the thing that people were ordering the most. Uh, and I think that's where we're at with the Enlightenment worldview, where there was a lot of things that weren't serving us that were somewhat cumbersome that um, are being purified out and being removed in order to make make room for um, a more complete uh, product, a more a per more perfect metal, so to speak. As you're talking, I'm thinking of I don't know why, but obesity. It's like thinning down what we've imbibed in an unnatural or an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. And this is cutting the fat. Absolutely. Yikes, though. If you say that, can you say that in public? It, it gets <laughs> crazy, right? Um, I don't say a whole lot in public well, you about just COVID. Did. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, again, the the metaphor with obesity, for example, in Chinese medicine is that there's a tremendous amount of insulation, and that insulation creates a lot of heat. And I think that's what we see where um, COVID is a disease where you have tremendous heat trapped in the interior. That heat can be um, thought of in Western medicine as inflammation. Um, and I think that the amount of extraneous matter in our society has really served to trap it and has served to... Um, provide insulation for this heat um, so that it can burn from within. And that's not good. Or um, it just is. So with a, with a Taoist medicine, nothing is good or bad. <laughs> um, does it work? Yeah, it's not just does it work. It's, um, you know, it just has a very flexible worldview. So when uh, there's, there's a story about um, that Zhuangzi says, um, about the morality where um one of the one of the key ideas in confucianism is that um people are inherently good um and this is a very confucian idea this is a very um you know socrates expresses this idea as well that people are inherently good and um the example that he gives is that um if you saw that a child had fallen from a bridge and was in a river that Whoever you were, you would go save that child. Um, Zhuangzi would counter, on the other hand, that um, the reason that we save the child is actually from our innate fear of death, uh, and that it's actually not out of being inherently good. So the Taoist perspective would be to kind of let go of um, life and death, and the um, you know let go of life as being superior to death which is very challenging in a medical practice where people are usually paying you to keep them alive. Um, so wow. to the extent wow. that um, Taoism doesn't necessarily view things as good or bad uh, in the same way that we're accustomed to, especially in medicine, we could say that COVID, it's not really good or bad. It's just what's happening. Last question. This is so interesting. I'll keep going if you want to. Sure. I mean, maybe not on COVID. <laughs> yeah, we can. Oh, we got it. COVID's electrical. You know, it's like it's electric. It's 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 risky. Yeah. Which is kind of odd because it's happening to all of us. It seems like the one thing we should all be able to talk about. <laughs> I mean, right. Um, so here I am. I have a leg. My leg that I'm always trying to put on and, and be obedient to is this Orthodox Eastern Christian leg. And I want to sit down when I'm sort of confused and listen to the elders and the saints of old, like say even the recent Saint Paisios. And 
I hear you speaking about Chinese Taoism, and I wonder, do you ever think, are they speaking about the same thing, or are they speaking about the same thing with different vocabulary? Is it a fundamentally different thing? Can we put them together as old world? Is it fair, or are they really two different things in your mind? I would feel very comfortable lumping together specific traditions of Taoism with um Orthodox Christianity. There's a lot of other information in Taoism. Um, you know, there's some unusual, you know, there's consumption of elixirs, there's unusual sexual practices, there's all sorts of things in Taoism um, that are not part of what I think of when I think of Taoism. Um, not because they're not in there, but just because they're not something that I use in my day-to-day life. Is that okay to pick and choose that that way i think that traditions have picked and chosen uh, throughout history so you see fragmentations where specific schools at specific times in history um, split off from one another because they had these differences where um, one particular school in the song dynasty became the favored school of the emperor because they were willing to um you know, engage in some somewhat questionable uh, practices, whereas other schools kind of split off and focused on their own thing, you know, doing services, being monks, and getting awesome at martial arts. Right. We could do martial arts. (laughs) But I think what I want to do is I'm going to end with this. As a villager, the old world is not a place you have much of a problem with. You're comfortable. Mm Mm-hmm. This is a should question, so it comes with, it's always fraught with value, right? So you have to do value on this. Should we move closer to an old world understanding in order to perhaps right the ship in what we call America today, which would also include Europe? Is that a good idea or does it happen naturally? It should, In other words, should, should people in a democratic society fundamentally take action to move toward a certain worldview? Do we allow things to happen naturally and 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 what I think Westerners would call a, a type of apathy? Do we listen to podcasts like this and then just tuck them in and think about them at night before we go to bed? What, what would you call in terms of, um, call people to in terms of action as a doctor in the Eastern tradition? What would you do? Um, the first thing I would say is that we are inevitably moving towards a more old worldview, I think. Um, the, there's people, whenever you make a change, people sort of fall off the ship. And then once they've fallen off the ship, um, you know, they look and see what's around them and they discover that it's the old worldview. Um, as far as action, um, I am always encouraging my patients to be more old world. Um, that can take a lot of different shapes. That can mean doing strange exercises in the park at specific times of day. That can be mm. drinking nasty um, nasty water made out of roots and twigs. I do that. <laughs> <laughs> we just shared one, weirdly. <laughs> or you drank mine. Yeah, I, I had a little bit of his because you, um, you don't always get to taste what your patients drink. <laughs> and it's good to experience it. Um, but in terms of the action... Um, so I have a fundamentally old world view, and I want to bring that to people because I see that it helps people. Um, so you can reframe it in terms of um, acupuncture advocacy in the United States, where I originally thought that my the best advocacy I could do would just be hit the streets, you know, give good treatments, and help people out. And then recently I've had more exposure to the governmental side of things, the advocacy groups, um, state organizations, and that sort of thing. And they are doing hard work that most people don't want to do in order to push forward a field. And that's coming from a somewhat new world perspective, since it is interacting with um, the U.S. government, and it is um, pushing something forward as... um, as an objective um, through this system, you know, integrating with Western medicine. And there are, um, it's a major topic of discussion, even within Oriental medicine, of where we should fall on the integration spectrum. 
And essentially it comes down to, um, do we want to be fully old world? Can we be fully old world? Or um, are, is it just new worlds and we can take some knowledge from the old world and bring it in there to improve the old world and make it a little bit more personable? So what we see a lot um, in hospital settings, for example, with acupuncture, is that we have very intense medical treatments, um, you know, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, people, people don't feel like they're human anymore after receiving that much treatment. And that's when you see that people are bringing in these old world ideas. They're bringing in healing touch, Reiki, acupuncture, um, mindfulness meditation. They're bringing in all sorts of things because they're trying to restore um, that human spark to the medicine. Well, let's do this. I want to thank you. Uh, will you come back? Absolutely. There's a lot more to say. <laughs> it's super cool. Uh, I would say this, that as one of our first guests, I think you put a lot of meat on the bones that I've been trying to resurrect in terms of what is old world. And I think for folks out there, you also gave pause. Like, it's not that weird. That because look, man, you know, like I watch baseball, okay, and I enjoy scotch. And then I was laying on your table, and I had never thought I would do acupuncture. But what happened was, is all the disparate ideas that I'm wrestling with in this podcast about new world, old world, suddenly they were becoming real on the table. Like you were an, a practitioner of old ideas, mm -hmm. and the the man the, the the thing made manifest like your hand on my back or your the needle in my liver area that actually was a type of language an old world language that suddenly was super real mm -hmm. you know and then i liked it because i'm often in my head you know i i'm projecting about what old world is and then you're suddenly doing it to me and that was my experience in Africa and Guatemala and in, in, in Georgia was I was actually being done by the old world. You know, it was it was happening to me and then it happened to me again in your office. And so that you could come on the show, uh, hopefully, and, and, and um, share some of that with these guys is super cool. So to you, brother, Shenny's Gagi Marjos. Shenny's Gagi Marjos, of course, uh, is what they say at the Georgian table, and that would be in the Georgian Republic. That means to you the victory. It's often said, as I said, at the KP table. That's our pod for today, James. Uh, you were amazing. Thanks for coming in. Thank you guys for listening. Watar, that's why are we talking about rabbits, is produced by Andrew Short and Daniel Paternos, both who've spent extensive time overseas in the old world. Our pod is brought to you by the creators of First Things Foundation, a nonprofit that lives and works in some of the world's most impoverished places. We immerse there in order to create momentum for local change makers, folks we call impresarios. We work on their vision and for their vision of a better life. Share Watar with friends. Hit us up with a solid review on iTunes and everywhere you get your podcast. Your love for us allows us to serve others. Nachvamdis, hasta la luego, au revoir, cambufo. And what would we say from a Chinese perspective? Do you know? I do not know. I'm a terrible Chinese. Well, person. you don't have to know Chinese. <laughs> you just have to practice the medicine. So we'll say um, someone out there knows right in and let us know. But for everybody out there, peace out and, and much love. <laughs> <laughs>